Okay, so let me just share screen first. This is the screen I want to share. Okay, uh, today we are on the One Belt, One Road, or uh, simply called Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative consists of the belt and the road. Um, interestingly, uh, the belt refer to the yellow uh, yellow line there, uh, which is the land uh, connection with the rest of the road. And the road refer to the maritime road, which is uh, depleted in the bright uh, blue here. So the, the road means the old silk road, but I uh, refer to the um, maritime silk road whereas the belts are uh, referred to the land routes. Of course, this is a simple, a simplified um, a diagram. The, the third uh, Belt and Road Initiative um, International Conference have just finished. Uh, there are 151 countries participating in the forum. So there are almost um, three quarters of countries are involved in this Belt and Road. So I will present this in two parts, basically. The first part is uh, using the uh, AI, the chat GPT, uh, GPT to give you what the West uh, consider this as Belt and Road. And then at the end, I will present my own reasoning. So uh, the Belt and Road Initiative or BRI is also known as the Silk Road Economic Belt and the 21st Century Maritime Silk Road it is a large infrastructure and economic development project uh, initiated by um, Xi Jinping uh, in 2013. And therefore, this year is is uh, our third, uh, sorry, a ten anniversary. And therefore, there was the uh, international con conference on on it, uh, just last week. Um, the initiative is designed to strengthen trade, investment, infrastructure connectivity, uh, between China and the rest of the world. Uh, here, it typical mention. Asia, Europe, Africa, even parts of America. Um, for example, Argentina and Brazil are involved in Belt and Road as well. Uh, so is uh, Australia. But unfortunately, uh, the relationship with Belt, Belt and Road Initiative was signed between um, China and Victorian government. And we know that our federal government limited the responsibility, uh, limited the ability of a, a state government to sign uh, national agreements. And therefore, I think it was revoked. Of course, there are two components. One is the economic belt. The other, the other one is the uh, maritime silk road. Uh, this is the same uh, picture again. So let's look at some of the examples which have been, which have achieved in the past uh, 10 years. Uh, not all projects are completed, but they are uh, progressing very well. For example, uh, one of the initial investments is the China-Pakistan uh, economic corridor. China built a port at here, Quota, Quota port. And then build a light uh, train road up pa uh, Pakistan, as well as developing a highway, which will eventually connect to uh, mainland China. A, what's that name? Uh, uh, Kaska, uh, connect to Kaska. So if this, when this is completed, that means uh, energy, uh, especially oil, from Middle East 
do not need to go through the Malacca uh, Malacca Malacca Strait and can um import inland at Kuala uh, Kuala uh, uh, Kuala ports and then ship directly into China. So it was when it was announced. I think it is a sixty billion um. U.S. dollars investment representing about five percent of uh, Pakistan's um, GDP. So that is obviously a very important uh, investment. Uh, the next one is the port as Sri Lanka. It has a liquid a bulk port which will be used to transport um mainly uh, again uh oil and also a multi-purpose port there um another example is in um africa uh, especially from uh Djibouti. now Djibouti is very interesting uh china has one and only one military base and that military base is in Djibouti. And Djibouti holds a lot of military base, including uh, the military base of China as well as United States. China built a uh, railway uh, from Djibouti to somewhere here, this railway. Again, I have talked about this uh, Gada port in Pakistan. It's part of the China Pakistan economic uh, cooperation. So this is here. The corridor here is so this is the uh, Pakistan port. Pakistan port. In Greece, China also is building a shipping port. Uh, we see there are the uh, Chinese Overseas uh, Container or Corporation, the, the ship managed by China, somewhere here. Uh, this is the image I get from online. Uh, Kenya Standard Gorge Railway uh, connecting uh, the Kenya's capital to uh, the port city in uh, Mombasa. Uh, this is very important and Again, uh, as high speed rail, the rail has uh, should be uh, isolated from other traffic. Otherwise, uh, there will be uh, level causing, and level causing is a big problem. Uh, just about a month ago, um, US has the first what they call high speed rail uh, in Florida. It connects the um. Miami with Orlando. Unfortunately, that railway is not uh, isolated uh, or uh, blocked off from other traffic. So in the first day of operation, there was a accident. The train collided with a car in a level crossing. And in the second day, the same happened. So it is operation in the first two days, uh, about five lives are lost because uh, the train is running on a well which have level crossing with roads. The what they call high speed is only two hundred and one kilometers per hour at its maximum uh, speed stretch. The other part of the railway. Uh, runs much lower than that. The average speed of the whole journey from Orlando to uh, Miami, which is about 380 kilometers apart, take about three hours and 45 minutes. So it is about 100 uh, kilometers per hour on average. Uh, this one, the Kenya Standard Gorge run at 250 kilometers per hour. Uh, it is not considered high speed, high speed rail in China. The Jakarta uh, 
Bandung um, High Speed Rail in Indonesia. Uh, this one just opened uh, about two to three months ago. During, I think it's the Asian uh, meeting, something like that. So this one just has just uh, begin commercial operation. Uh, Pakistan, Portugal, Silk Road Maritime, uh, again, with uh, Gada Port. This one, oh no, this one. With Gada Port, it is now possible to connect um, Pakistan with uh, the rest of uh, Europe through a shipping arrangement. Again, there's another corridor in Kenya, and uh, this corridor uh, in uh, mainly for economic development. It consists of railway, high speed, uh, high highway, as well as pipelines. Another in, in, uh, interesting thing is about the China-Europe railway network. We know that China is one of the largest um, manufacturing hub in the world. A lot of products is actually uh, manufactured in China. Previously, if you want to ship, ship any uh, product from China to Europe, one of the consuming uh, consumer centers, they you have to ship through from one port on the western coast of China, travel down South China Sea, and then turn around at Singapore, pass through the Malacca Street, and then probably go through the Red Sea, through the Suez Canal, pass through the Mediterranean, and then somehow got to the port and then ship to there, or going through pass pass out from Spain, turn around and then go to Amsterdam or something like that. So that journey took about twenty eight days. But if we change it onto a train, not at high speed, just a normal train running at about two hundred kilometers per hour, passing through Kazakhstan, and then. Uh, some of the uh, East uh, East Europe countries and then uh, into R Russia and then coming out again and then reaching the um, ports in, say, Amsterdam or go to uh, um, Germany. This track takes about uh, 14 days. So it is about two weeks uh, shorter in terms of the time taken. The, uh, at the moment, there is about a thousand such uh, train um, in a thousand in about a, a month. Yes, about a month. So another track is go right up to um, Russia into Siber uh, si Siberia and then go through to um, Russia's capital, Moscow, and then go come out from Moscow through Ukraine or through the country next to it and then again. So this is the rail network. The rail network have been operating for, I think, five years, something like that. And now it facilitates both uh, goods in both directions. Previously, uh, it was only in one direction, mostly uh, products made in China shipping to uh, continental Europe. But now there's a lot of other goods also flowing from the other direction, from Europe to China. Now look at why Xi Jinping uh, have to suggest this uh, Belt and Road. What is the political reasoning behind this? This part is according to uh, AI from Chat GPT. 
it want to increase geopolitical influence. That's one reason given. The other reason given is for security and stability. Uh, enhanced economic ties and infrastructure development can contribute to greater political stability and security in regions along the BRI routes. Stable and friendly laboring countries can reduce potential security threats and conflicts that might disrupt China's development and economic interests. I think that is uh, quite accurate in terms of this, but it is too general. Almost every action by a state somehow is related to its uh, security and stability, and also including its uh, political uh, influence. Counterbalancing the U.S. pivot to Asia. I will come to this point more, um, more in more details later on because I think this is the one of the a real reason uh, BRI is uh, created to meet is to meet the challenge of uh, U.S. a uh, pivot to Asia. So I think this is the valid point, but I will come come into this much in much more detail. Exporting China's political model, that is absolutely wrong. Um, China do not want to export its political model. China has always been saying that uh, there are more than one uh, political model for any country. The choice of political model should reflect the culture and the um civilizations and circumstances of the country. There's no uh, one set um, that meets all requirements. Now, this is very different from uh, our Western uh, political model. We, also, we always say we want to export our political model being uh, using election to uh, elect a government and using uh, free trade or capitalism to organize our uh, economic system. So basically uh, what the West call freedom and freedom and what and democracy. So there is only one political model. China say, okay, if you want to adopt that model, fine, fine with me. I'm only wanting to trade with you. What is a political model doesn't matter. But at the same time, China is also saying we we have our own political model. You want you will find our political model um interesting. You can study it and you can adapt some of our policy into your political model. China is not uh, exporting any uh, political model or ideology ideology so that part, this slide is completely wrong uh, from my perspective but anyway as i say this come from the ai from chat gpt the next one is a fostering regional stability uh, china has is is a non alliance country that means china is not going to sign any uh, treaties with any other countries so that when one country is uh, acting in one way, China is always supporting that country or not supporting that country. No, China doesn't want to do that. China wants to evaluate every situation uh, by its own merits and then make its own decision. China do not engage in any alliance or treaties. Like, for example, NATO treaties. No, China is not interested in, in that. So in a way, having trade and with trade volumes might foster regional stability. But we also know that it is only a possibility. Look at the trade 
war between USA and China or the technological war between uh, United States and China totally reflect um, this regional stability is depending on a lot of more a lot more uh, different kinds of factors not just uh, economic strengthening domestic political support again I don't think uh, B BNI uh, BRI is um, designed to do this the Chinese government enjoys a very high um, domestic support people uh, the a long term study of the resilience of Chinese political system by I think is Harvard a long term study uh, I think the whole whole study uh, takes about eight years find that about the national government uh, enjoys a, a population support of about 95% before COVID. And after COVID, that support percentage increased to about 98%. So Chinese government is, is enjoying a huge support from its citizens. So BRI isn't uh, one of the main reasons uh, sorry, uh, strengthening domestic uh, political support is not one of the reasons to create this BRI initiative. Leveraging uh, economic diplomacy. Again, um, the Western countries uh, like to accuse uh, China using uh, that trap to trap um, developing countries into aligning with Chinese uh, policy. Again, this is not true. If we look at, for example, Africa's uh, debt, Chinese debt only represent about a 5% of the total uh, sovereign debts of all the uh, African countries. And most of these sovereign debt is owned to uh, Western institutes, not uh, Chinese institutes. And China has been very generous for uh, debt uh, um, reorganization or uh, debt um, elimination. So again, after looking at the um, political reasoning, I also asked um, chat GPT for the economic reasoning. So these are the reasoning uh, given by uh, AI. Trade expansion. Uh, China is already um, the major trading partner of about 160 some countries in the world. And for 2023, the three, the first three quarters, China's uh, in, uh, import and export expanded only by 4.9%. In that expansion, especially in the third quarter, export still increased. I think it's about 6%, but import decreased by, I think, 0.5%. That means China trade is continuing expansion, uh, trading more and more with the rest of the world. Obviously, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative will help, but that is not the uh, sole reason. Increased investment opportunities. I think this is a very important point. Again, I will go into this uh, in more details later on. Overcapacity utilizations. The West consider uh, 
China's um, production is over capacity. That means um, they are trying to shoot China in terms of dumping of uh, products. For example, United States accused China of overproduction in aluminum and steel. But the fact is that, yes, China is the largest uh, uh, steel uh, production uh, country in the world. The second one, I think, is uh, America and China's uh, capacity or production is about 10 times of America's. But the amount of exports from China in terms of um, iron products represent only 3 to 5%. I can't remember the exact detail, about 5% of its total production. So most of the iron products uh, produced in China are basically consumed in China. And of course, many of them will be exported as a finished product. For example, the um, in a fridge, uh, the case, etc. Another important so-called overcapacity is obviously the high-speed rail. Before COVID, China competed a four by four grid, uh, four hor uh, horizontal, four vertical. Uh, horizontal meaning running from uh, east to west, vertical mean mainly running from north to south, uh, a four by four grid. And for uh, stimulating domestic economy, uh, during COVID, China decided to increase that grid to eight by eight. By eight almost meaning doubling the number of um, high-speed rail mileage as well as normal train, uh, train lines in the next five years. So the capacity has been utilized, not necessarily have to be uh, exported. Now, for example, we talk about the example of the high-speed uh, of the rail in uh, Indonesia, I think uh, not this one. Before that one? No. No. Which one? We, we talk, uh, yes, this one. Uh, the the high-speed rail in Indonesia. Actually, China ex uh, exported the technology to Indonesia. So this high-speed rail was actually built in Indonesia with Chinese technology and Indonesian uh, workers. Okay, coming back to here, no. Uh, trade expansion, yes. Investment, yes. Over capacity, uh, no. Okay. Uh, China managed its industrial capacity pretty well. Natural resource access. Being a one of the largest um, manufacturing hub in the world. Of course, it needs natural resources. Uh, we need uh, raw material in order to manufacture goods. So yes, uh, natural resource access. China get it, all its resources in the open market. China doesn't use any military force to uh, force a, a developing country to sell its resource uh, under market uh, value. Of course, when we want to uh, buy resources from a country, especially a, a developing country, we need mechanism to get the resource from its production site to the port in order to ship around the world. And therefore, Belt and Road Initiative uh, do help to build uh, railway, uh, highways, as well as trains to help the natural resources to to enable natural resources to be traded in international market. But again, that is not for the sole purpose to be used by uh, China. It is 
helping the developing country to uh, get involved in international trade. Economic growth and development by helping the participating countries with infrastructure development, then the uh, participating countries should and should be able to make use of their um, enhanced infrastructure to to grow um, economically. So, yes, that's correct. Financial uh, services and institutions. Now, at the same time when B BRI is, is initiated, China started two uh, financial in, in, uh, institutions. One is the Asian in uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB. Another one is Zero Fund. Actually, there's a third one. It's the New Development Bank. AIIB is a investment bank similar to the World Bank, but its initial focus is on Asian infrastructure. But at the moment, uh, we at the uh, it operate, we notice that this uh, AIIB is now more global. For example, at the moment the um. Director General was the Brazilian uh, president, the last uh, Brazil's president. She is now based in Shanghai. Zero Fund is a operate like a private uh, investment fund, but the the money comes directly from uh, Chinese government. It invests. Uh, uh, on the uh, belts initiative. That means the land lines there in order to help to uh, facilitate the investment of B BRI. Expansion of Chinese technology and innovation with exporting uh, products, then companies uh, can make more um, profits, and these profits can be used in R and D, research and development, and hence um, provide uh, the uh, economic um, support for further te technology and innovation um, development. Currency internationalizations. Uh, not until last year, China being the largest trading countries in the world, uh, being the major trading uh, partners with the majority of countries in the world, the use of uh, Chinese currency, renminbi, uh, yuan, in international trade was only about 3% to 5% before uh, the Russia and Ukraine uh, conflict. But after the uh, February 2022, last year, there was a realization that the international trade does not need to be uh, uh, balanced or paid using U.S. currency. There's no hard requirement on that. And using U.S. dollars as the uh, trading currency also have a major uh, drawback. When you trade using US dollars unavoidably, you need to have some uh, US dollars reserve in order to facilitate your trade. The examples from the Russia Ukraine conflict, we see that 
United States can single-handedly frozen uh, Russia assets in US dollars. That means any country who end up being targeted by United States government may suffer from a sudden frozen of its assets by the US government. Another example is, of course, uh, Afghanistan. When US retreated from Afghanistan, there is about $7 billion of uh, the uh, money of Afghanistan uh, uh, banks in US uh, Federal Reserve. Biden frozen all this money and confiscated this money, setting half of it to help the victims of 9-11 and then use the other half of it for other purpose. Now remember, Afghanistan is not the guilty party of the 9-11. Of course, we know that uh, Americans invaded Afghanistan using the false accusation that Afghanistan, uh, Afghanistan uh, half harbor uh, Osama bin Laden. And later on, we found that Osama bin Laden was actually killed in Pakistan, not in Afghanistan. And US um, uh, armed forces have been in Afghanistan for 20 years. They achieved nothing. So the whole accusation is wrong. But Afghanistan being a weak country, there's no other way to stop Americans from uh, confiscating is really... Um, lead to foreign reserve uh, being only $6 billion, but it was frozen and confiscated, uh, making the hardship even worse. And therefore, a lot of countries now realize if we continue to trade in US dollars, we may subject to the same treatment by United States. Now, another important thing is when we conduct international trade, then countries need to settle the trade differences. So there is a default standard, which is called SWIFT. Uh, the SWIFT organization is in Europe, but it's mainly controlled by United States. At the early stage of the Russia and Ukraine war, Russia was kicked out from this SWIFT system so that Russia has no way to settle its trade because international trade, the bank clearing system, the Russia is being kicked out. So Russia is forced to create an independent uh, bank clearing system. So is China. And therefore, the internationalization of Chinese currency wasn't um, the objective of BRI when it was first uh, formulated. But in, those, in today, um, almost 10 years later, we will find that BRI will help to internationalize the Roman B as a trading currency. That becomes true, not because of the design but because of the global uh, geopolitical uh, circumstances. Debt-related interests. Uh, China provides loans and financing for many of these BRI projects. And of course, these uh, loans create uh, interest, and that interest will help uh, Chinese financial institutes. This is similar to any other other uh, Western institute which uh, give loans 
to projects or governments in order to um, earn interest. So there's no difference here. And therefore, I don't think this is really one of the main reasons uh, for BRI. Finally, again, going back to the uh, political um, reasoning, uh, we come up also with the economic and stability usual and the global inference. So this is almost the same. Okay, so we have looked at the, the reasoning from AI, from the Western point of view. So what is my own reasoning? So from here onwards, it will be Albert's talk, <laughs> my, my thinking. First of all, I want to establish some historical facts first. Um, when China first opened up, in the late 70s, China and United States enjoyed almost 30 years to 40 years um, honeymoon period. But the relationship turned sour about 2010. 2010 is a very critical time. Now, China joined the WTO in the year uh, 2000. So it is about 10 years after China joined the uh, World Trade Organization. But for the first um, 10 years in the 21st century, the relationship between USA and China is still pretty good. But in um, 2010s, the situation suddenly turned very bad. So we have to look at what happened. One way to look at it is looking at the world's GDP. Of course, we know that um, the world GDP, uh, the American GDP is right up there, which isn't rep represented in this graph. The second largest economy uh, before uh, 2010 was Japan. But from the graph shown here, at about 2009, China almost becomes the second largest economy. At that time, Japan's economy is about five trillion dollars and Chinese economy is about 4.9 trillion. There's about uh, how much um, serve at 20 million 20 million dollars before uh, China catch up with uh, Japan and becomes the largest, uh, the second largest economy. Uh, China actually becomes the second largest economy by um, April uh, 2014. April 2014, which China uh, overtook uh, Japan and becomes the second largest economy. So that's why I say uh, 2010, is a critical time. Looking back a little bit longer, about 300 years ago, it was the Qing Dynasty in China. At that time, China was the world, one of the world's largest economy as well. But unfortunately, it has a very weak military power and it was pre-industrial. That means it lacked the ability to mass produce uh, goods. And of course, producing steel is one of the major issues. So when the West and China met about 300 years ago, 
China found itself military very weak against the Western powers. And therefore, Chinese suffered several hundred years of humiliation. Uh, today, Chinese people still remember uh, what happened about 100 years ago. 100 years ago, Chinese people are still very, very poor. Uh, 19, in 1920s, uh, Qing Dynasty just collapsed. The uh, Republic of China is formed. But there were warlords fighting each other in China. And after this First World War, because China participated with uh, the, the West, so it was considered one of the countries who win the war. But unfortunately, the area in China's uh, Shandong area was uh, taken away from Germany and given to Japan. Without China's the ability to say to to say no, and that is the result of what we call the May Fourth Movement. But anyway, uh, at that part, China basically uh, suffered about two hundred years of humiliation by that time. So today we realize that. You may have a very large economy, but you cannot protect yourself. Then your survival is in big question. Today we can look at a lot of examples, Afghanistan, Iraq, or Palestine, etc. If you cannot protect yourself, somebody will take advantage of you. So one of the most important things for the Chinese is to make sure you have the ability to protect yourself. That, was, that wasn't a priority until in 2012, the then US government, Obama, uh, Barack Obama, started his so-called East Asia strategy, or specifically the pivot to Asia. It represented a significant shift in foreign policy in the United States. The key areas of this pivot to Asia include strengthening bilateral security alliances, deepening our working relationships with emerging powers, including with China, engaging with regional multilateral institutes, expanding trade and investment, and most importantly to the Chinese leadership is forging a broad-based military presence and advancing democracy and human rights. I highlighted forging a broad-based military presence in among many of the key areas. Because as part of this um, increased military presence, United States is going to put about two thirds of its naval power into Pacific area. So as a Pacific country, China look at this policy and then ask the question, why United States need to put two thirds of its power in Pacific Ocean, Pacific area. So it looks around, evaluating every Asia, uh, Asian countries, but this uh, uh, Pacific countries, China cannot find a country worth the effort of two thirds American naval power, except itself. So China suddenly realized, A, United States now treat 
us or treat China as the major threat or at least major challenger. And it needs to put a huge military force in our doorstep. Remember the hundreds of years of humiliation which Chinese has just suffered not too long ago. Our leadership understand if we do not increase our defense mechanism, it is very easy to go back to these years of humiliation, which obviously is not good to the people. And if you look around and looking at the military bases, we find that America has a full control of the seaboard of China. Uh, China where is the light yellow area. And then in the rail law, we have the South Korea. We know we have a strong military presence of American force in South Korea. Next to it is Japan. And we also know, know that um, there's a huge military force in Japan. Moving down, Taiwan has always been a close alliance with uh, United States. Although when China and U U.S. normalize its political uh, relationship. Part of the uh, manifesto include the one China policy. And therefore, the United States should leave the military base in Taiwan. But unfortunately, it didn't happen. Taiwan is still buying military uh, equipments from the United States. And United States military are now also on Taiwan Island, although in a informal, non-official basis. But the fact is that there are military personnel in Taiwan, although not in uniform. We also know that we have a military base in Philippines. Going down, we have, uh, as part of the pivot to Asia with um, strategy, United States trying to have military base in Vietnam. That means any shipment going out from the seaports from China, going to Europe. In the summer, it might go through the North Pole, move up through the uh, gap between South Korea and Japan, and go into the North, uh, North Pole, and go around there, come out from uh, Iceland and reach um, Europe. That's one way. But that is only possible during summer, uh, summer in the Northern Hemisphere. But the major uh, shipping shipment, for example, energy, oil, has to come through the Market Street, has to come through the Market Street, the yellow, the, the red area here, turn around at Singapore, pass through the South China Sea and reach the rich China. Looking at that, in case of military conflict, Chinese seaboards will all be blocked by United States military. So this is the first island train chain. And not to say the further apart, we have the Philippines, uh, sorry, the uh, Hawaii there, which it forms the second island chain. That will make China very isolated. So one of the main 
main objective is try to break this um, containment. How to do that? One way is to build a naval force to counter the U.S. containment. But unfortunately, naval force, it, building naval force is a multi-decade endure. You cannot uh, build a naval force in a year. 10 years is almost the farthest way. So the window of opportunity you need you need at least 30 to 40 years before you will be able to have a naval force strong enough to break the US containment strategy that means we need a another strategy fast cannot depend on the naval force that doesn't mean that China shouldn't build a naval force. It only means that building naval force is not a solution to the containment strategy of the United States. The main concern is actually China depends heavily on the energy imports from Middle East. And oil must pass through the street of Malacca and South China Sea. And that's why we see that the first major um, BRI, BRI initiative is this uh, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. That is a corridor which will enable China to ship its oil from Afghanistan into China without going through the Malacca Street and the South China Sea. And not to also mention the shorter time taken. So that's why the CPEC is a very important part of BRI. As I has explained, the pivot to Asia reveals to China that USA treated it as the major challenger. So that is part of the background. Now look at another data is China's trade surplus. This trade surplus only up to uh, April 2020, basically the first quarter of 2020. We see that China's trade uh, worldwide is mostly uh, a surplus. China is not running trade deficit, it's running trade surplus. And it's in, it increased tremendously by 2014, but about 2015, it peaked and then progressively in a much higher average than previously or even in this rising uh, situation here. Trade shepherds, by definition, must be stored as values outside of China. So first thing, China has accumulated huge trade surplus, and they must be held as foreign assets outside of China. Now, if you move these foreign assets into China, well, that is a trade in whatever form, either as investment, as uh, goods, etc. Once you move that trade surplus into China, that becomes imports into China and that, that reduce the trade surplus. And therefore, as I say, by definition, all say, uh, trade surplus must be represented by the government's ownership of foreign assets. You, you 
park that money somewhere. Traditionally, that money is parked into the U.S. government bonds. So China has been uh, buying and buying and buying of the U.S. government uh, treasuries. But we must remember in trade, the product that sells represent a value um, value add through the sweet and blood of the Chinese workers. So it is unwise to say, okay, we don't want trade surplus. We just give it away. No way, because first of all, there is a huge value there. And secondly, that value represents the sweat and blood of Chinese workers. There's no way giving that away uh, without compensation. And if the Sino-American relationship versions, then the U.S. government bonds can easily get frozen, just like what happened after the Russia's uh, Ukraine conflict. Another question is that, should China's trade turn to China deficit? Again, there's a historical lesson to learn. Uh, there is an argument, of course, this argument is morally corrupt, but anyway, this was a argument. When Europe, or in particular, uh, Britain, uh, United Kingdom, trade with China during the Qing Dynasty, China is selling mostly tea, porcelain, and silk, and making huge trade surface. These trade surface had to be settled by silver. Therefore, a huge amount of silver is flowing into China. Then the West found that the silver is getting less and less, unable to pay for the goods. So that again, China is having a huge trade uh, surplus against the Western countries. In order to balance that you have to increase the Western export to China. But unfortunately, most of the goods available in the West is not selling well in China. So eventually they pick opium and intoxicated a huge population of Chinese and when the Chinese government want to stop the opium imports from the Western countries, they use military force against the Chinese government, and that is the opium war. So having huge trade serpents also had its own uh, risk. You can only protect against that when you have a strong military ability. Unfortunately, building such a military abilities is a decades long and doer. It will not solve the immediate uh, problem. So we need some, some, some mechanism to park that huge trade surface somewhere outside of China. As I said, moving that into China represent trade and meaning you cut down the serpents and looking at the serpent, serpents, it, it was increasing. Of course, there are peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys. Okay, every, every line, then you have peaks and valleys. That is absolutely correct. But on average, 
we see that the Chinese trade surplus is actually building long term. In 2000, it was like that. And then in the later part of the first decade of uh, the 30th, uh, 21st century, it is on this level. But in the second decade, it is already in this level. And we know that, for example, in 2023, 20, uh, the trade is, is also expanding at a rate of about 4.5%. So it is at a higher level progressively. But very interestingly, in the Chinese holding of the U.S. Treasury doesn't increase. Although we see that in the in this part of the curve, we should have a larger trade surplus, meaning China should have been buying more U.S. Treasury. But instead, it went almost fat, actually going down from the peak at, in around uh, December, uh, December 2013 and going down to the minimum at around uh, December six, uh, 16 and then stay almost horizontal. Where is Where had this surplus gone? in those years. China is still making huge trade service, but the service is not represented as increased holding of currency in US dollars. So the big question is, where did the trade service go? since 2013. Of course, my answer is Bell and Road. Bell and Road Initiative is the investment of the trade surplus in other countries in order to make long-term uh, investment and probably help other countries as well. Okay, that is my presentation, and then I will open up for questions. So I will stop share here. So if you have any questions, unmute yourself, and you can ask me, and I will try my best to answer. Yes, very, very. Oh, yes. Please. I was just uh, wondering if is that why they seem to have been uh, very active in the Pacific area, uh, building parliament houses and various things. Uh, yes or no? Um, of course. Uh, when you see a challenge. The obvious response is to um, build a defense mechanism. Uh, for in particular, the Solomon Island, uh, we Australia created an opportunity for the Chinese to to go in. Remember, we have some uh, rioting in Solomon Islands not mm -hmm. too long ago. And we sent our federal police, but unfortunately, the federal police uh, choose not to protect the commercial interests of the Chinese uh, migrants in Solomon Islands. So the local Chinese uh, communities uh, is asking the Solomon governments for helping them by asking the Chinese to come and help. So the Chinese government said, okay, you want me to help you, for example, to train your police officers 
provide you with um, police equipments, we are happy to do so. And therefore, the, there is a safety agreement between the Solomon Islands government and Chinese government. And obviously, um, the Australian government has a huge response and saying that uh, Chinese government is interfering with Pacific Islands uh, policy. Uh, we treat the Pacific Islands uh, governments as our own uh, backgrounds. When they ask for help from the Chinese, uh, they are saying, no, 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 we can't, you can't. And then and suddenly uh, there's a huge response from us and from the United States as well. But you look at the historical background, actually recreated the opportunity for the Chinese to come in. Because during a riot, a, the federal, uh, the Australian federal police should stay independent and help everybody. You just cannot uh, regret the Chinese uh, businesses in Solomon Island. The, the response from Solomon Island's Chinese communities, of course, ask for help. If the help cannot come from Australia, then the, net, the, the natural selection will be, hey, China, come here. We are Chinese, so we are we are not treated well here. Come, come here to help. And the Chinese, of course, say, yes, why not? We, we want to protect you. And then come and talk to the Solomon Island government. I say, well, we will come to help you. We will teach you, for example, ask you, what do you want? Hey, 5G network, fine. We have good 5G network. Let me build the 5G network for you. And you have no money. Oh, not a problem. We have Be Bell and Road. We can lend you money. How long you want to repay it? 10 years? Oh, two sorts. What about 30? 30 years? Or 50 years? You don't have to worry. What about interest? Okay. What about 2%, 3% per year? Because after all, this is Chinese trade surplus. As I said, you will hold this trade surplus in US dollars. It is very, very risky at this point in time, at, at least. So it is better to change it into some assets in foreign countries. For example, Solomon, Solomon Islands. That's one of my, my reasoning. Okay, any any other question? One oh, more. Oh, Sorry. No, Sorry, go on, Roy. Question with regard to um, Russia and China at the moment. I, I believe there's a, there has been ongoing a pipeline transporting uh, energy from Russia into China, but that may be accelerating now because of the situation in the Ukraine. Have you got any idea how that's progressed? Because I don't think it was on the Belt and Road Initiative initially. I think it's just very much a commercial decision between the, the two countries. Yeah, oh, similar to the amount of uh, LPG we, we sold to China. Remember, I think that is during the Tony Abbott's time when some big company in Australia here signed a huge LPG uh, support uh, export with China. Again, yes, um, Russia, again, it needs to diversify its uh, trade. Of course, we know Russia's economic center is in the West, around Moscow. But Russia has been trying to join with Euro Euro European Union uh, since it uh, get, um, since uh, USSR uh, collapsed. For example, the first presidents want to join U European Union. And in the early days of Putin, um, Russia also want to join European Union. But it failed. United States not going to allow Russia to join European Union. Because if that is to happen, with the huge resources from Russia, 
shipping cheaply to industrial centers in Europe, for example, Germany. Then the, the European products will be very, very competitive internationally, making Americans trade worse, not competitive. So it was always the long-term policy of United States to block the uh, allying Russia with uh, European unions. So after about 10 years, Russia, Russia, Putin realized that um, there's no way we can join uh, Europe. So he has to look for other ways out. One of the ways out is, of course, through uh, the stands uh, countries, the Kyrgyzstan, Ukrainian, etc. Another way is, of course, third east, the big China there, join with China and then sell the product to China, and therefore. In around uh, 2010, I think, uh, uh, early days before Bell and Road, then uh, Russia signed a long-term contract with China to supply China with oil by pipelines. So there are huge pipelines from Siberia going into the northern part of China. And that has been ongoing. And of course, um, last year's China, uh, Russia and Ukraine war shows that that was a great strategy. Now, when uh, Europe um, apply sanctions on Russia, Russia say, "No problem. I, I would don't you would you don't want me to trade in U.S. dollars? Fine." We trade in ruby, and then suddenly the Rush the European find that you still have to buy uh, Russian oil, but not through the pipelines, through some mechanism. And among them is uh, is of course Saudi Arabia. You know Saudi Arabia made a lot of money last year because. He buy his own oil from Russia and sell his own oil to Europe, making a huge profit. So is China. China also um, signed some long-term uh, LPG um, contracts with United States. And the contract was signed before the uh, Russia-Ukraine war, of course, as a, a as a value which was considered high at that time, but today, with the Russia-Ukraine war, the LPG is much more expensive. So Chinese um, oil companies say, "Hey, hey, that's LPG which I order from you. Don't send it to us. Send it to Europe. Charge us at." This contract price, but I will earn the money. So the Chinese got, got uh, oil companies also making huge profit last year through this uh, trade, and obviously for lucky for uh Russia, the the trade increased since the Ukraine war. I think it's about sixty percent. Huge uh, huge increase, but. Russia's economy is small compared with China, so it only represents a small increase in trade in China. But uh, for Russia, it is a huge increase in trade with USA. Albert, um, did, did I did I miss it, or did you not reference uh, BRICS? The BRICS next week. Next week, yes. Oh, okay, right on. <laughs> yes, it's on your it's on your schedule for this one. Yes. Okay, right. Yes, 
uh, next week, we are looking at the um the foreign policy. So we talked about the uh, doctrines last week, and this week we you look at one example, the bank role as part of the foreign policy. And next week we will look at another part, which is BRICS. So yes, I will answer the question. Thank <laughs> you. Week. That's good. No problem. Yeah. Anyone else? Any question? We're good. Oh. Okay. If that's the case, we'll finish a bit early. <laughs> good. Good. Okay. So Thanks, thank, you for, thank, thank you. Thank you for coming. And then we will see you uh, next week. Bye-bye. Take care. Take care. Thank you, Albert. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.